Funding for Meeting of Minds is provided by this station and other public television stations. Welcome to another Meeting of Minds. Returning for a continuation of their earlier discussion, our guests this evening are, from 4th century Africa, St. Augustine of Hippo. From 6th century Constantinople, the Empress Theodora. From 18th century America, President Thomas Jefferson. And from 20th century England, Lord Bertrand Russell. And now, your host, Steve Allen. Thank you very much. Hello again. In speaking with Lord Russell last week, we found him to be um, a genial unbeliever, but one with certain almost Christian views. Lord Russell would have us look to reason and science, however, for our salvation. St. Augustine, of course, takes a very different view. From the Empress Theodora, we learned of her impoverished, even uh, scandalous background. And as for Thomas Jefferson, well, he's seen by American eyes in such a heroic light that we tend to think of him as the enormous figure on Mount Rushmore, more like a god than a human being. What then can we actually and accurately say of Thomas Jefferson? That he deserves the mantle of greatness with which time and American bias have clothed him. And hopefully this evening we shall come to know more of the real Thomas Jefferson. Yes, I wonder, Mr. Allen, if you as an American citizen realize that your third president was also an inventor. No, I didn't know that. What did you invent, Mr. President? Oh, a number of things. An adjustable desk, a portable copying machine, a plow, a central heating system, a swivel chair. My goodness. Did you make much money for your inventions? <laughs> I was lucky enough to be blessed by nature with a number of gifts, sir. But a gift for the earning of money or the management of it was not among them. <laughs> I conducted my own financial affairs so poorly, in fact, that when I died, I was very close to bankruptcy. Really? But you know, my friends, I absolutely revel in the idea that I can speak my mind freely here and not have to worry about consequences, except those dictated by my own conscience. I don't quite follow you, Mr. President. But you see, in my lifetime, I was attacked by a press that was hostile, even at times vicious. Is that right? That's hard for us modern Americans to grasp. Practically no one criticizes you now. But is that perhaps why you publish so little in the way of political philosophy? Absolutely. I, I try to make as small a target of myself as possible. I see. I wonder what it was, Mr. President, that uh, provided the source of your, uh, your creative energy, your fervor. Well, perhaps it was nothing more, Mr. Allen, than my familiarity with the realities of political life in Europe. I knew something of European history, of course, mm -hmm. and except for the scholars of the Enlightenment, uh, the whole continent seemed to have learned nothing. <laughs> Through my years in Europe, I often amused myself by contemplating the characters of the then reigning sovereigns. Yes. What sort of people were they? Well, Louis XVI was a fool. <laughs> the King of Spain was a fool. Is that right? And of Naples, the same. Amazing. Yes, they passed their lives in hunting. Hmm. The King of Sardinia was a fool. The Queen of Portugal was an idiot by nature. <laughs> <laughs> and so was the King of Denmark. <laughs> uh, the King of Prussia, successor to the great Frederick, thank you, was a mere hog. <laughs> Gustavus of Sweden and Joseph of Austria were really crazy. Oh. And George of England was in a straitjacket. Oh, yes. Mm. To sum up, I was determined that we would avoid the dreadful mistakes made by the Europeans. I wrote to James Monroe in 1785, that a trip to Europe would make him absolutely adore his own country. Mm. My God, how little do my countrymen know what precious blessings they're in possession of, which no other people on earth enjoy. Yes. Mr. President, your own life was so full of uh, activity and creation, I doubt that you spent much time looking on the dark, pessimistic side of life. <laughs> of course not. And for all those who do <laughs> spend time uh, thinking about such dreadful things as the a possible end of the world. Well, let me give them a little advice. Be prepared for it. And the best way to do that is to live a good life. If ever you feel that you're about to say something amiss or do something wrong, consider beforehand. You will feel something within you which will tell you it is wrong. This is your conscience. Be sure to obey it. Our maker has given us all this faithful internal monitor. And if you always obey it, you will always be prepared for the end of the world. 
or for a much more certain event, which is death. <laughs> this must happen to us all. It puts an end to the world as to us. And the best way to be ready for it is never to do a wrong act. Mr. Mm. President, you've just said in a few moments what some priests have taken a lifetime to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I, uh, well, I wish that humankind had by now developed in intelligence to the point where it wouldn't be necessary to shake a stick in its face and say, be good. <laughs> Do you see any alternative? Certainly. Science. Reason. You know, religion, I think, is based primarily on fear. It is partly the understandable terror of the unknown and partly the wish uh, that you have a kind of elder brother to stand by you in your troubles and disputes. In any case, fear is the basis of the whole thing. Fear of the mysterious, fear of defeat, fear of death. If you had lived in my time and place, Russell, I could have taught you fear. I have little doubt of that, Your Majesty. <laughs> you were quite prepared to order the death of anyone who displeased you. But that would be reasonable fear. I refer to unreasonable fear, and science can help us get over this craven kind of fear in which man lived for so many centuries. Science can teach us, and I think our own hearts can teach us, uh, to look no longer for imaginary supports, uh, no longer to invent allies in the sky, but uh, rather to look to our own efforts here below in order to make the world a fit place to live in and not the sort of place the church has made it over the centuries. Russell, you have no right to assume that almost everyone has your kind of intellect and is capable of your kind of self-comforting rationality. Your brain is a gift of God and you should use it for his purposes. One of those purposes should be encouraging mankind to have faith. Ah, uh, faith. Father, people who feel they must have a faith in order to face life are showing a kind of cowardice, which in any other sphere would be considered contemptible. But when it is in the sphere of religion, it is thought admirable. I cannot admire cowardice in any sphere whatsoever. You're tedious and no, no, you Please, 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 let us change the subject. Mr. Jefferson. I'm curious about your early years. Well, I was born in comfortable circumstances, Your Majesty, so in a sense, I'm not a good example of the American dream. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to struggle, you see. I was born on my father's estate, Shadwell, in Albemarle County, Virginia, in April of 1743. What did your father do? He was a civil engineer who became a justice of the peace and, and later a member of the House of Burgesses, which was the legislature of Virginia. He was also something of a free thinker. Mm. And your mother? She was a member of the one, one of the most prominent colonial families, the Randolph. How did you become politically prominent? Again, circumstances, Father. At 16, I entered William and Mary College, where I became a good student. <laughs> I loved academic life and the mental stimulation, and I became associated with some very interesting gentlemen, one of them being George Wythe, who was a leading member of the Virginia Bar and a great scholar. In college, I studied languages, natural sciences and mathematics. I really enjoyed all these things, although I dropped out at the age of 19. Later, I joined Wythe's law office. I was admitted to the bar in, in 1767 and practiced law for seven years. Mm, you must have enjoyed that. No, Mr. Allen. I found that being a lawyer was not entirely to my taste. I wanted something more. More, really? But the law, as a profession, was beginning to change, to expand its philosophical horizon. In what way? Those of us engaged in law at that time gradually came to see the profession as being far more than a money-making occupation. It seemed to us that it could be a powerful force in shaping the, the institutions and the culture of our people, mm -hmm. and therefore is a potent instrument for social reform. But you must have enjoyed speaking out your great ideas, huh? Oh, no, Mr. Allen, not at all. I very much disliked making speeches. Really? Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> but in those exciting debates about the prospects for revolution and freedom... Oh, you I hated debate. <laughs> I once coined the phrase, the morbid rage of debate. Mm. Because it seemed to me that men are never really convinced by such argumentation. They're much more convinced by reading and by reflection. Well, perhaps this should be, Mr. Jefferson, but I devoted most of my life to debate against heretics. Indeed, Father. But I loved good, provocative conversation. In fact, if any of you had been guests at Monticello, you would very likely have done just what we're doing now. 
But you, uh, at Monticello, you must have found the time for solitude, Mr. President. Is it true that you wrote a total of some 18,000 letters? <laughs> yes. Oh, so busy a pen, you must also have written a great many books. Only one, Your Majesty. Notes on Virginia. And I didn't originally see it as a book at all. But pardon me, sir, what about the book people call Jefferson's Bible? <coughs> that consisted, Mr. Allen, of the sayings of Jesus without the additions of others, such as St. Paul. Oh. Strange to say, many Christians seem to put as much weight in the statements of Paul as they do in, in those of Christ himself. Mm, I see. Well, you started to tell us of your political background. Yes. My political life began in 1769. I was then 26. Mm -hmm. When I took a seat in the House of Burgesses, the lower house of the colonial legislature, and held it until I was sent by Virginia as a delegate to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia in 1775. There I became prominent in the deliberative bodies. Things moved very fast. It was a time of revolution, a marvelous moment in history to be alive. Think of it, to be part of a completely new concept in self-government, mm. new laws and institutions, republicanism instead of government by a distant parliament and an unreasonable king. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was not an easy time, of course, and there were moments when it looked as if our cause was lost. <clears throat> but I consider myself fortunate to have been part of it all. Mm. Mr. President, how could the United States always keep precisely the form of government which you and your friends devised for us? What? <laughs> Sir, I consider that a very strange question. Oh? Well, it is obvious that I am biased in favor of such government, and I hope it, that it will never be lightly cast aside. But each generation has the right to choose for itself the form of government it believes is promotive of its own happiness. Our Constitution is important. It's been a great protector of the freedoms of the people. But there is this dreadful tendency to ascribe to men of a preceding age a wisdom more than human, and consequently to imagine that whatever was done in ancient times must be beyond amendment or improvement. Good for you, Jefferson. <laughs> This is a very foolish way to look at things. Laws and constitutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. New discoveries are made, new truths disclosed, and new problems present themselves. Laws and forms of government must keep abreast of these changes. Mm. I see. On another subject, um, Mr. President, in more dignified or conservative times, the aura of uh, scandal uh, attached to the Empress Theodora's name, if you'll forgive me, Your Majesty, would have caused many people to regard her with strong moral disapproval. Now, does it in any way depress you, sir, as one of the idealistic creators of our American society, that not only does Theodora herself today uh, tend to be viewed in somewhat glamorous terms, but that even many living Americans seem to be greatly admired and envied despite their scandalous lives, as long as they're successful. Yes, it saddens me greatly. It's an extremely dangerous situation for our society when criminality and indecency are considered praiseworthy or amusing and decency is held in low regard. Our nation was founded in a burst of idealistic energy. We were able to look back at the terrible price Europe had paid for tyranny and for corruption, and we wish to avoid such errors, or at least to diminish them. Mankind will truly reform itself, sir, only by the grace of God, not by the advice of emperors or presidents. Then why does our maker withhold such a blessing, sir? I do not know. Nor does anyone else, my friend. Plato observed in his Timaeus that the maker of this universe is past finding out. Now, surely here, sir, is an assertion in which both believers and non-believers can find agreement. But we proceed to add, Your Lordship, that since philosophy unaided cannot lead them to God, at least with any certainty, they must therefore turn to revelation for this. Oh, not again. <laughs> <laughs> if it had been proved to the satisfaction of all mankind, Augustine, that there was indeed such a thing as divine revelation, your argument would be unassailable. But this is precisely the point on which your argument stands or falls. By revelation, you mean, of course, Father. The record of the Old and New Testament. Precisely. And surely you must know that even among extremely devout Christian and Jewish Bible scholars of the present age, there exists the most 
of incredible diversity of opinion about literally thousands of specific Bible references. Uh, you, Your Majesty, were a Monophysite Christian, and you differed with Augustine in believing that Christ had only one nature. The Bible clearly says so that... The Bible is noted for several virtues. Clarity is not one of them. <laughs> The scriptures are, in fact, the most incredible hodgepodge of factual inaccuracy, internal contradiction, atrocity represented as divinely authorized, and crimes defended simply because they were committed by men who, it was already decided, were holy. How dare you, sir? So, you see, my friend, far from winning the day by moving the argument from the realm of uh, reason to that of revelation, the religious believer rather ensures his defeat at least to the satisfaction of men and women of intelligence who have taken the trouble to study the scriptures. Now, if we assume, for purposes of argumentation, that there is indeed such a thing as an all-wise, all-good, all-loving God, then I argue that to assert that such a divine entity is the primary author of such an atrocious literary record as the Bible is the worst possible insult to the deity. <laughs> Disgraceful. Indeed, it has puzzled me over a long period of years that intelligent people, some of them very virtuous and well-intentioned, could possibly worship a being morally inferior to themselves. I shall pray for you. God is the supreme being, sir, supreme in every way, all-powerful, all-good. How could you possibly be so wicked as to hate an all-loving, all-powerful... Oh, please, I, I do not hate God. Only an insane person would hate God. I simply find no evidence for the existence of such a person. He existed before the heavens and the earth. Father, I wonder if you can tell us precisely what God was doing before he made heaven and earth. He was preparing hell for priors into mystery. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, my friend, he was not doing anything at all. Or if he had been doing anything, we would have to assume uh, that he was creating. Assume, assume. Father, would you concede that here again there is something uh, that you supernaturalists simply cannot explain? For your argument leads us to think of a time uh, before time began, which is a contradiction in terms. Yes. There is a great deal the believer cannot explain. What? But there is even more the unbeliever cannot explain. Good. A clever turn of phrase, learned doctor. But the area that the unbelievers can explain grows daily. While you priests are never able to probe one inch farther into your realms of mystery than you were countless thousands of years ago at the beginnings of your speculations. Your Lordship, do you perceive anything of value in Christianity at all? Oh, most assuredly, Your Majesty. There is nothing human or natural that is totally evil. As Shakespeare observed when he said there is an evil wind that blows uh, no good whatever. <laughs> and there are many uh, charming and virtuous people who are Christians, though I suspect they're simply nice by nature. <laughs> <laughs> and I have always found that element of Christianity uh, most attractive, which was in turn most humble. You yourself, Augustine, admired Plato and Plotinus among the ancients. And you know, Neoplatonism was a rather appealing form of Christianity, insofar as his negative theology was concerned. Well, Lord Russell, could you make that a bit clearer for us? Yes, well, I'll try. I suppose that's partly up to us. <laughs> <laughs> the negative theology of which I speak declared that all we can truly know about God is what he's not. And if we have no way whatever of knowing what he is, I find the humility here rather endearing. <laughs> Even if we cannot know what God is, Russell, we do know what he does. You do not, in fact, know any such thing, my friend. You observe what he's done, and then you simply assume something about a, a force powerful enough to do it. But even among the most intelligent Christians over the centuries, philosophers such as yourself, sir, Origen, Clement of Alexandria, Nicholas of Cusa, Abelard, Eusebius, John Scotus Erigena, Aquinas, among all of you, as I say, we find the most heated disagreement repeatedly on dozens of important questions. Such as? Well, as for Origen, who was one of the fathers of the church, mm -hmm. he differed with Augustine on the question of predestination. And Origen believed in a successive variety of worlds. He believed, in other words, in reincarnation. Did he really? 
Yes, he felt that the body must somehow be refined or spiritualized before man could be saved, and consequently that the soul must live again and again through many bodies and perhaps many worlds before it would be pure enough to return to its heavenly home. My now, your Christian churches at the present moment are firmly of the opinion that such a belief is utter nonsense. It is considered now by Christians a degraded, pagan, inferior, oriental notion. Mm. And yet if Origen were here at this table, as may I suggest he may someday be, mm -hmm. he would doubtless defend such a view with no doubt as much creativity and sense of certainty as you are displaying yourself, Augustine. But is there anyone in the audience now who believes in reincarnation? Oh, yes. You, a young lady, you believe in reincarnation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> but, Augustine, you Christians, if you're to uh, talk convincingly to the world, at least to the most intelligent inhabitants in Italy, you must get your own houses in philosophical order. It is pointless to say to the world, Christianity is the answer when, as I repeat, there are 1,001 forms of Christianity in the yes, world. Yes, and when, moreover, some of these forms have been literally at war with others over the centuries, not hesitating to use the arrow, the spear, the sword, poison, the machinery of torture, and the hideous fires of the stake in alleged defense of a loving Christ and a merciful God. Heresy, Mr. President, must be stamped out and vigorously in defense of Christian truth. Your Majesty, you have just agreed to your own death warrant. What? For in Augustine's opinion, you were a heretic. You asked me a moment ago, Augustine, what in Christianity I find admirable. Well, it has just occurred to me that another endearing habit of Christians is their tendency to throw themselves on their knees while praying. <laughs> well, it's small wonder that Christians spend a certain amount of time on their knees. The wonder is rather that they ever have the temerity to stand up again, <laughs> considering their historical record. Oh For surely you must know to your own sorrow father that the record of christian history is far more than that of the new testament far more than the writings of such distinguished and charming philosophers as yourself far more than the edifying lives of a handful of saints it is also the record of what vast armies of christians have done in their formal capacities as christians down through the centuries oh jesus was very wise in suggesting that we know things by their fruits uh, that is uh, by their results Ideas, as it has been said, have consequences. And I would think that every Christian scholar would shudder at contemplation of many of the consequences of Christian philosophy through the world. Russell, if an Englishman becomes a murderer, is his crime the fault of all England? Mm -hmm. And, Mr. President, if an American is corrupt or otherwise evil, is this sin to be blamed on you or the other American founding fathers or your philosophy? And as for Christianity, it has achieved many glories and produced many blessings. Beyond any doubt, my friend. But if anyone imagines that is all it has produced, he's very much mistaken. And moreover, has the moral obligation to examine the full, not just the partial, historical record. Why? You Christians even approved of slavery for centuries. You personally, Augustine, said that the slave must be subject to his master. Yes, and I regret to say that those of us who wish to abolish slavery were very bitterly attacked by the churches for our efforts. You know, Mr. Russell, although the great Thomas Aquinas would differ with me, there is a certain sense in which the Christian, perhaps the believer in any other religious philosophy, will always be at a disadvantage in an argument with the pure rationalists such as yourself. I have perceived the disadvantage, Father, and curious to know if you and Lord Russell would agree on a definition of it. And I refer, Mr. President, to the fact that though we ought to follow reason to its uttermost limits, never speak of it contemptuously, there is nevertheless a portion of that realm encompassed by religious belief, which exists outside the boundaries of reason. And again, though Aquinas would disagree, I personally concede, for example, that by purely rational standards, the existence of God cannot be satisfactorily demonstrated. What? This in no way weakens my own faith in God, Your Majesty, be assured. I am merely making a concession required by the standards of reason itself. But the rationalist defines the terms of the classic debate in such a way that, as I say, the religious believer must ultimately fail to meet the rationalist requirements. Yes, well, your concession is graceful, Father. I would add only that 
When the believer has been forced by requirements of reason to a position with his back against the wall, then he simply solves his dilemma, at least to his own satisfaction, by leaping over the wall and now proclaiming he's in a territory where reason cannot follow. Do you deny, sir, that anything exists on the other side of that wall? I see no evidence to prove it, Your Majesty. Would you perhaps agree, gentlemen, that uh, while reason cannot determine which of a thousand conflicting religious forms is truly that of God, that reason can nevertheless determine which is the best, the most worthy of an intelligent individual's respect? Oh, yes, most assuredly. Perhaps your question arises out of the assumption that a rational analysis of the claims of rival religions would lead to the conclusion that, as you might say, the Roman Catholic form is superior? Of course. I would only observe that millions of devout Christians would disagree with you. More importantly, even if the Roman Catholic uh, were the best of all forms of religion, that would have nothing whatever to do with the question of whether it was valid. Hmm? Uh, for instance, in a series of philosophical mishmashes, that which was least offensive might be termed the best without its being valid or true, whatever. Hmm. <laughs> would it be correct, Father, to say that uh, the bulk of, uh, the great bulk of your writing, and you left behind an enormous volume of work, yes, that uh, it was written mostly in the heat of such controversy as uh, yeah, this? Yes, yes, I opposed heresies of all kinds. Mm -hmm. As for the pagans, it becomes easy to detect the error of those who prefer to worship many gods, for their wise men, whom they called philosophers, used to have various schools, were always in disagreements with one another, and they made common use of the temples, however. You, you know, it's occurred to me that uh, it's odd that the pagans could boast of the greatest, most brilliant philosophers, uh, Socrates, uh, Plato, uh, Aristotle, and the rest, and yet their religion was, uh, it's safe to say it now, thousands of years later, uh, really stupid. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> uh, before commenting on your point, Augustine, let us make quite sure that we grasp what you mean. You were saying that the weakness, the error of the philosophers, mm -hmm. was not so much that they worshipped many gods, which mm -hmm. as our host has observed was a ridiculous form yes. of religion, but rather that their various forms of philosophy were in constant disagreement? Yes, that is precisely what I mean. Very well. And you have just offered a remarkably convincing proof of the falsity of the Christian religion. What? How do you mean? As we look about the world, sir, we see that Lord Russell was right in pointing out the thousands of individual sects and churches, each of which insists that it preaches the best possible sort of Christianity. It therefore follows that if Augustine is right, as I for one think he is, that there cannot be a number of mutually contradictory versions of the truth, then it inescapably follows there cannot be many mutually contradictory versions of Christianity, all equally deserving of our respect. Far from refuting me, so you have, on the contrary, supported me, and as handsomely as I might have hoped to do myself. Good for you, Augustine. For I agree that reason is scandalized by the existence of a host of rival claimants to ownership of Christian truth. But all that such an argument proves is that there can only be one right form of the Christian faith. No, oh, that word again, faith. For the mankind has eventually to realize that it must stand on its own two feet and not look vaguely into the skies for help. Now, as for the faith that sustained you, I don't doubt its value in your own case. But faith itself, precisely what is it? In the case of faith about something that exists and can be proved like chemical formulas, I uh, see no harm in arriving at an answer and having faith that your answer isn't correct. But in matters of the abstract and intangible, faith can be dangerous and harmful. Man's capacity for self-delusion is well documented and frightening. Well, Lord Russell, to survive in any profession for a long period of time, some uh, 70 years in your own case, <coughs> requires a considerable strength of uh, mind and spine. What was it exactly that uh, sustained you? What were your beliefs and passions? I was maintained by three very simple, but very strong passions, Mr. Allen. First was the longing for love. Second, the search for knowledge. Third, an unbearable pity for the sufferings of mankind. These passions, like a great wind, drove me hither and thither in a wayward course over a deep ocean of anguish, taking me sometimes to the very edge of despair. I sought love in the first place because it brings ecstasy, an ecstasy so great that there were times when I would have sacrificed all of the rest of my life for a few hours of that joy. <coughs> Secondly, I sought love because it 
relieves loneliness, that terrible loneliness that we humans feel when our consciousness lets us look out over the rim of the world into that cold, unfathomable, lifeless abyss. An abyss, my friend, inhabited only by God? Well, lastly, I sought love because in the union of love, I saw as in a mystic miniature that vision of heaven that saints <coughs> and poets imagine. This, then, is what I sought, and though it may seem too good for human life, it is what I eventually found. You speak pretty words, Your Lordship, but you were married how many times? Four. Divorce for yours apparently was easily achieved, but easy divorce seems to be a curse in this modern world. Justinian and I would not allow it, except when the man or woman wished to enter the religious life. Yes, divorce is a great evil indeed, because it may lead to the abandonment of small children. But I respect your yearning for the bliss of love, my friend. I found it with my two mistresses. However, passion may not last, but the love of God and for God lasts for all eternity. Our Lord Jesus Christ preached love for all. He opened his arms to all mankind. Yes. You know, very few people today seem to feel that they've uh, they found a true place and purpose in life. Why is modern man so insecure? The answer is simple. If you believe in God, and his divine purposes. You understand that you're a part of life in order to serve him. If you serve him well, you will find satisfaction. You will not look with contempt or suspicion on others. Mm. Thank you, Father. May we uh, return to history? Certainly. All right. Uh, we mentioned the bias of uh, the Roman Emperor Constantine in favor of Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps we should clarify that uh, Constantine did not make Christianity the one uh, religion of the empire. He did, however, say that it was the religion favored by the Roman state. Well, Constantine was personally chosen by God to make the Catholic faith dominant in the world. You don't know that, Augustine. <laughs> Why did God wait 400 years to choose Constantine? Why didn't he choose Augustus Caesar and save more millions of souls? <laughs> but Constantine appears to believe that he was so chosen. And this is very important, you see. Oh, why is that? Because Constantine and those emperors that came after him were no longer regarded as the most powerful individuals whose strength derived from the support of the army, mm -hmm. but rather as those who ruled by direct divine sanction. Ah, I see what you but mean. But even more importantly, gentlemen, this change meant that the Roman Empire was now considered much more than a powerful state. The state was now viewed as part of God's plan for the salvation of mankind. Mm. Last week, Father, um, we had started to discuss the reaction of Roman pagans when mm. the empire began to crumble. Oh, yes, yes, we did. Well, now, when the Goths, under their king Alaric, uh, recaptured uh, Rome in the summer of 410, the shock to the Roman upper classes was very, very great. Do you know the pagans blamed the defeat on Christianity? Yes, most yeah. people were unaware that the Goths were Christians. Hmm. Hmm. Well, then, uh, Gibbon, in his uh, decline and fall of the Roman Empire, was not the first to advance such a theory. By no means, but there's small profit in seeking credit for such a theory, uh, because his argument was totally groundless. Uh, it was not the fault of us Christians that Rome collapsed. I responded to such arguments by writing my City of God. You know, a factor that emerges from uh, all of our conversation here is the perverse nature of man, which has frustrated so many utopian and other philosophies, Lord Russell, you once suggested that mankind needs to think in terms of equality in order to feel uh, peaceful and secure. But surely man needs to be more malleable uh, if he's to arrive at that point. But the thing that strikes many people about human nature is it is not very malleable. Oh, I cannot agree at all. Nor can I. Human nature is infinitely perfectible. Improvable, of course. Now, you compare a dog with, let us say, a wild wolf and you'll see what training can do. Mm -hmm. The domestic dog is a very nice, comfortable creature, whereas a wolf is something entirely different. Now, you can do the same thing with human beings. Human beings, according to how they are treated, turn out totally different. And I think the idea that you cannot change human nature is absolutely silly. Oh, Russell, you fail to distinguish between human nature and human behavior. Do you concede, my friend, that men can be reformed? Of course, by taking Christ into their hearts. Well, yes, that sometimes occurs. But they can also do it by taking Buddha or Mohammed into their hearts. Or, for that matter, Karl Marx, most unfortunately. But <laughs> my point is that man's nature can be reformed, civilized. Yes. Then the question becomes how? 
By education. But not merely the academic kind, sir. We need a realization of the soul. A belief that man is more than just an intelligent animal. And that he is, in fact, the dear special creation of God. And that, my friends, is where the ideal of human dignity originates. Human dignity. Yes. But the terrible truth is we live in a world still plagued by so many kinds of suffering, starvation, people being put to death. Yes, one of the reasons is overpopulation. Mm -hmm. Something you uh, warned us about many years ago. In fact, I doubt if any philosopher has been more vocal on that subject than yourself, sir. Yes, in which I was roundly condemned at the time. Mm -hmm. But I'm pleased to see that the subject is finally meeting with proper consideration. Mm -hmm. There are still some, of course, who are shocked by the idea of birth control. Well, I am one of them, sir. We have no right to interfere with one of God's own processes. Oh, now you approve of sex. Formerly you wrote about it as the devil's handiwork. <laughs> but whether we are discussing responsible parenthood or any other serious question, it's refreshing to be able to exchange ideas in complete freedom. Yes. It's incredible what dreadful things have happened because people would not permit the free exchange of views. That way lies tyranny. Yes, but it's unavoidable as long as mankind prevents free inquiry. The purpose of education should be to produce thought, not belief. In other words, to teach people how to think, not just what to think. Precisely. Youngsters are still compelled to hold positive opinions about doubtful matters instead of letting them see the doubtfulness and be encouraged to independence of mind. Mm -hmm. Education ought to foster the wish for truth, not the belief that some particular creed is the truth. I agree, but I think it is possible to arrive at a degree of truth. The basic moral tenets of Christianity and Judaism form truth, in my opinion. The Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule. I see no harm in accepting this as a creed by which to live. Surely, if nothing else, the religions help to keep people on the straight and narrow. After all, religions do espouse virtue. Yes, but often very dangerously. And your Ten Commandments, Mr. Jefferson, and by the way, they're far more than ten. Count them sometime. <laughs> <laughs> say that God personally forbids the making of statues. Well, it is no sin to make even a religious statue, as Michelangelo could tell you. But due to the identification of virtue with religion, plus the fact that the most religious men are usually not the most intelligent, oh, there are notable exceptions, of course. <laughs> a religious education gives courage to the stupid to resist the authority of educated men, as has been shown where the teaching of evolution has been made illegal. Yes. Gentlemen, you speak eloquently, but you deal in supposition, theory. Life is a minute-by-minute -minute physical experience. Our bodies dictate our actions even more than our minds. The body has its hungers, and if those hungers are not met, then all your theories are vanities. I doubt if any of you gentlemen have known what it is to be really hungry or to be in need of basic shelter. Are we to be criticized because we were not poor? <laughs> poverty is no laughing matter, sir. I was a product of poverty. I saw people starve. I saw them die in the gutter. I know what it meant to excel my body for food. If all men had this natural godliness that you seem to think they have, Augustine, if all men had your infinite intelligence, Lord Russell, or your nobility, Mr. President, then your lectures might have some impact. But the majority in my day barely made a living. And you can boast of science and reason in your modern world, but half the population of the Earth even now is living on a bare subsistence level. Life is still desperate, and yet you idly talk. You are right, Your Majesty, yet it is through talk that we communicate, that we make decisions, discover the means of righting wrongs. We must talk. We must question. <sighs> Mine was a more practical life. So you'll pardon my skepticism. We'd like to know more about that life, Your Majesty, if we may. Now, last week you told us about your uh, marriage to Justinian and how later in the year 527 he became emperor and yourself empress of the Byzantine world. Uh, again, for those who might not have seen this last week, what sort of a fellow was Justinian? He had a good mind, but rather opulent sensual taste. Part of the colorful character of Byzantine art stems from his own taste, you know. He loved glitter and color, but he ate very simple foods and he did not drink. He was a scholarly man, but he gave the impression of being somewhat aloof. But he loved to surround himself in grandeur whenever we made public appearances. Are you suggesting you did not? Perhaps because I had so little pleasure and comfort as a child, I reveled in it as an adult. <laughs> so little pleasure as a prostitute? 
Sir, you are naive. A prostitute pretends to be pleased, but they are primarily actresses. <laughs> but don't imagine that Justinian was simply a creature of vanity. He was a leader who believed in law and was a Christian who believed in your version of God, Augustine. What were some more of his accomplishments? He freed Africa from the Vandals, took Italy back from the Ostrogoths, and recovered a portion of Spain from the Visigoths. Is that right? Your Majesty, we're told that uh, Justinian's sleep requirements were minimal. Is that true? Indeed it is. Hmm. I envy him that. Some described him as the man who never slept. Oh, nonsense. But he did seem to be adequately refreshed after just an hour or two of sleep. Why? Well, it sounds silly, but that fascinates me because my normal sleep cycle is 11 hours a night. Really? Mm -hmm. You and I have that in common. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, seriously, I envy men like Justinian and, you know, Thomas Edison, Cho and Lai, uh, men who needed so little sleep. And Mr. Allen, you would appear to have been unconscious about 45% of your <laughs> life. <laughs> published a good deal but for that <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand your lordship one can do no harm while asleep <laughs> <laughs> your majesty um on another matter what was the official attitude during justinian's reign to um, an issue which in recent years has attracted a great deal of attention in western nations that of uh, homosexuality well, in the first year of justinian's reign the bishop of rhodes and the bishop of diospolis were found guilty of such unnatural practices High church authorities dismissed them from their posts. Justinian had them arrested, castrated, and paraded through the streets of Constantinople in disgrace. He was right to do so. The sins which are against nature, like those of the Met of Sodom, are at all times to be detested and punished. God's law did not make men so that they should use each other thus. Father, your harshness on this question can be defended only if it might be shown that homosexual acts resulted from a decision of will. They do not. No one decides to be homosexual any more than you decided to be a heterosexual. <laughs> but my friends, there is one other aspect uh, in relation to the conditions of ancient Constantinople, rather like our modern world, that is that superstition ruled the day. Mm. Yes, fortune tellers, soothsayers, astrologers, frauds of all kinds preyed on the ignorance of the people. In Her Majesty's day, there was some excuse for such beliefs. There is no such excuse in the modern world. Yes, it's depressing to hear people who look perfectly intelligent excuse their bad behavior by saying, well, after all, I'm a Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, it's no wonder he drinks a lot, he's a Capricorn. <laughs> uh, but to return to Her Majesty's time, my friends, there was one happy result from this terrible morass of sin, corruption, ignorance, and despair. In the Egyptian capital of Alexandria, in particular, there was a sudden resurgence of religious faith and practice. The very difficulty of the time increased the numbers of the devout. Mm. Yes, gentlemen. I found myself in Alexandria at this time, having left my lover, Hecabolus. I met some of the men and women of whom Augustine speaks. The patriarch, Timothy, in particular, became my spiritual mm. father. I see. It's most interesting. Well, on another subject, um, Your Majesty, the drama of uh, what are called the Nike riots had uh, considerable historic importance, coming as uh, they did so early in uh, Justinian's reign. Exactly what was the point of the Nike riots, and why are they identified by the term Nike? We had two rival factions, the Greens and the Blues. Mm -hmm. Originally, they cared only about the games, but in time, they became involved with more important matters. For a long time, the emperors had been able to play one faction against the other. But in this new instance, the common people were angry about taxation, corruption in government, inflation. Yes, and in consequence, the Greens and the Blues joined forces in order to, uh, well, as they would like to have seen it, thrown the rascals out, meaning Justinian and Her Majesty. They mm. shouted the word Nike, Nike, which means conquer or victory. Ah. Fires were started about the city. Justinian hurried to the Hippodrome, hoping to quiet the furious mob with a speech. But the people were not convinced by his words, well chosen as they were. Justinian was tempted to resign on the spot and flee, I understand. Yes, Mr. President. But I was strong if he was for the moment weak. I said to him, if there were no other safety left me but in flight, I would not fly. Those who have worn the crown should never survive its loss. I shall never see the day when I am not hailed as empress. If you wish to fly, Caesar, I said to him, well and good. You have the money, your ships are ready, the sea is clear. 
but I shall stay. For I love the old proverb that says, the royal purple is the best shroud. Mm. Justinian took strength from my words, and we won the moment. With the help of the army. Of course. Our defenders had to kill 30,000 of the rabble to restore order. Mr. Allen, your listeners might grasp the extent of the power wielded by Her Majesty mm -hmm. if they were told that she actually dictated to your church, Augustine, the appointment of a pope. The appointment of a pope? Yes. Yes, you see, in the year 556, the Vicar of Christ, the Bishop of Rome, was Pope Agapetus. The Pope and Her Majesty strongly disapproved of one another. Oh, why was that? Because I was a monophysite Christian. Agapetus had expelled our holy leader from Constantinople. The Pope was, in fact, attacking Monophysite leaders throughout the empire. He even had the nerve to attack us in Egypt, where we were the dominant Christian faction. Mm. After Pope Agapetus died, his successors continued his policy. However, one prominent Roman Catholic churchman, the deacon Virgilius, had been wise enough to curry favor with me, and he had promised that if he ever became pope, he would adopt a more reasonable policy toward us monophysites. Mm -hmm. When Agapetus died, I supplied Virgilius with money and hurried him off to Rome. Unfortunately, a man named Severus had already been elected. Ah, well, then your plans had been frustrated. How could you possibly do anything about that once the church had made up its mind? I communicated with Virgilius and also with a close friend of mine, Antonina, she was the wife of the great General Belisarius. Yes, and another reformed prostitute. Yes. Mm. We agreed to suggest to Belisarius that Pope Severus had plotted to hand over the city of Rome to the Goths. Did the General believe that? Evidently not, Mr. Allen. The religious side of the dispute was of little importance to him. His concerns were purely political. Yeah. He suggested to the Pope that the Church ought to work out a compromise with the Monophysites. Unfortunately for Severus, he refused repeated requests to be so uh, uh, reasonable. He was absolutely right to refuse. One cannot compromise on matters of principle. Principle, huh? Belisarius knew how to deal with such impertinence. He summoned the Pope to his palace and dismissed his personal guard. Yes, and the General's wife, your former friend Antonina, was in charge of things. That's right. She gave the Pope a sound tongue lashing, had him thrown in a cell and put aboard a ship to the east. <laughs> A short week later, my man Virgilius was consecrated Pope of your church, Augustine. After so many centuries, Your Majesty, are you still proud of your infamous maneuvering? I am proud, sir, of my power. In Her Majesty's defense, Mr. Allen, it must be said that because of Please her Please do not patronize me. And Constantinople itself was, in her day, one of the most corrupt cities known to history. In what way specifically, Mr. President? In all possible ways, sir. Adultery flourished. Prostitution was openly flaunted. Houses of ill repute were even established in the shadows of churches and monasteries. The close proximity of church and body house is not unique to Constantinople. Have you read the Old Testament? Of course. Then you must know about the temple prostitutes repeatedly mentioned in the scriptures. Vice is vice, your majesty, regardless of its point of origin. In every form of it, the natural and the unnatural flourished in your city. Gambling, too, had the populace in a frenzy. The Hippodrome, as you've reminded us, was the center of all this corruption. Not only did the two political and social factions dissipate their energies in nonsensical concentration on the outcome of athletic contests, but practically all the people were more interested in the games, the races, the executions at the Hippodrome than they were in important moral, social, or political questions. Mr. Jefferson, it seems very strange to me that an American would be so critical of the popular entertainment in the old Hippodrome. In your own country at present, there are hundreds of similar stadiums where your citizens are roused to a frenzy by athletic competitions, by gambling, by drinking. I also find it terribly amusing that an American would lecture another country or its people about corruption, either financial or sexual. I mean, your own cities are such cesspools of thievery, degeneracy, pornography, prostitution. I understand there are neighborhoods where decent women and children cannot walk down the street. Your point, Your Majesty, is God help us all too well taken. I pray that my countrymen may see the error of their present ways before it is too late. Oh? Too late for what? The common rabble will always want broad entertainment. Only a few are seriously interested in the arts and sciences and philosophy. In your day, Your Majesty, there was some excuse for this in that the common people could neither read nor write. But those of us who founded this nation... Washington, Madison Adams, Franklin Payne, Monroe, and the rest. 
We foresaw the day when an ever-growing number of American citizens would avail themselves of the benefits of education. For it is education that can create a more civilized, a more humane society. Oh, come off it. Look about your country today, sir. Millions have gone through your universities. Has this produced a vast generation of scholars, of scientists, of artists, philosophers? Hardly. Your people are literate for the most part, where mine were not. But what do you Americans read? The work of philosophers, of historians, of theologians, of other scholars, of your few great poets and novelists? The question is ridiculous. I assure you, Your Majesty, I am as saddened by this as you are contemptuous of it. And I quite agree with what I take to be the implications of your remarks that a democratic society without effective popular education is meaningless, perhaps even dangerous. If a nation expects to be both ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Uh, but, Mr. President, error has no rights. There is no natural right to publish harmful falsehood. My dear friend, both books and newspapers must be published in freedom. If the facts in a book are wrong, they should be disproved by those who know the truth. But for God's sake, let us freely hear both sides. Bravo, Jefferson. The war against illiteracy and other forms of ignorance, Augustine, cannot be conducted the way your church has waged it over the centuries. The primary purpose of your educators was religious indoctrination. You refused to teach any science whatever except what could be harmonized with your scriptures. And since they were so utterly unscientific, your science education was faulty and inferior. Oh, Russell, there were great individual scholars and scientists within the church. Indeed, there were, my friend. And during their lives, your church hampered and harassed them, even excommunicated and killed them. Oh. But I suppose we cannot attribute to either the church or our educational institution the fact, uh, the sad fact that today men seem to be becoming less more than more intelligent. However, at this moment, I see for the first time in history a technological hope. And that is? Television, radio, and the various popular forms of the media. Are now you consider, serious? I am serious, consider. Augustine, <laughs> Augustine, one of the most uh, magnificent instructors of history, could reach only a tiny little audience, even through his writings. But now, at this moment, he is being seen by millions of people. Oh, television has a marvelous potential for education, a, a, a potential that is hardly as yet realized. Yes. Would it be safe to say then, gentlemen, that a glance about the modern world will lead you to be less contemptuous of customs in the Constantinople of my day? Agreed, Your Majesty, we, but we were speaking not only of of popular ignorance and superstition, but of vice and depravity. Oh, see here, sir, don't pose as a secular saint in my presence. You were known as a humanitarian, but you kept slaves on your plantation, did you not? I do not deny it. Yes, I kept slaves. About 150 at one period. Most of the estates in Virginia kept slaves. They constituted the work body and they tended to come with the property. They were born on the estates and lived their lives on them. To have set them free at that time would have been irresponsible. Where would these poor people have gone? What would they have done? They would have become public charges. I can only tell you, Your Majesty, that I tried to treat them well. The whip was never used, common as it was in my day, as in yours. I wrote an anti-slavery clause into the Declaration of Independence, but it was struck by Congress. In 1778, however, I managed to get a law passed prohibiting the further importation of slaves. Sad to say, it took many more years and a bloody and bitter civil war before the practice of slavery was abolished. So for me, it was a matter of living within a system, and I tried to do that as decently as possible. You were married? Yes, Your Majesty. I married Martha Wales Skelton in 1772. It was a good marriage, but lasted only 10 years due to her death. Mr. President, is it true that you later had a mistress? 
and that she was a slave? You are speaking of Sally Hemings. The bluntness of your question makes our relationship seem sordid, which it certainly was not. Since we loved each other for a very long time and were not married, yes, the word mistress applies, although it is a word with unkind connotations. Sally Hemings was a mulatto or quadroon, partly Negro. Her father was John Wales, my wife's father. Hmm. And though they had different mothers, and so were half-sisters, they resembled each other closely. Sally was a child of nine when Martha died. The relationship that later developed between us was a deeply personal one. She and I did not know each other simply because I was the master of an estate, and she was a slave. My wife was dead. Sally Hemings and I loved each other. I think that's enough explanation. I can understand such feelings, having felt them myself. But why? If you felt so strongly about the woman, did you not marry her? We had a new nation, Your Majesty, but human nature did not change automatically with it. I was a political figure. An interracial marriage at that time was unacceptable. It would have caused a scandal. No one knew that better than Sally. Criticize me if you will, but I had to make a choice. My importance to my country or my own gratification. Unless you think my association with Sally Hemings was frivolous. I tell you that it lasted 38 years. And that we had three children. Thank you, Mr. President. And on that note, my friends, we conclude because we have no more time. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. This program was produced by KCET, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Meeting of Minds is provided by this station and other public television stations. Hitchcock, the master of the macabre, is profiled Wednesday night at 9.